this the service uh, the family service because we have something for everyone something for all ages but more importantly it's where we come together as one family to glorify the lord to praise his name and to bring him our struggles but also our thanks for his continual um uh, support and uh, for our his guidance for us so let's start off this morning by saying a word of prayer Father God, we thank you for all your blessings towards us, for being with us and guiding us every day, and for this opportunity to come together as one family to glorify your name. Bless those, Lord, who cannot be with us for any reason, whether it's work, whether it's health. Bless them, Lord, and help them to feel your presence today. We ask you to bless the rest of the service, Lord, and let it be a spiritual uplifting experience for all of us. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So a lot of you will know that this week was a particularly special week for a large number of children. A small number of children went back to school a few weeks ago. However, the majority went back this week to a certain degree junior schools were in full time, whereas the senior schools were in only part time. I could see from David, my young one, that he was like slightly anxious at the end of last week, going back to school. He's not seen his friends since December. He was telling us how he initially was keeping his distance from his friends, not sure how to behave. But I can assure you that by the end of the week, they were all on top of each other and the story started pouring in of what they've been up to. Christine, on the other hand, who is in senior school, um, was back for a few days. She was actually going in to do a, um, her prelim exams, yet she was telling me how nice it was to be able to sit outside with her friends and just talking. And it's so typical of us as humans that we only realize how good things are around us when, we go, when they go missing. If anything, this period in our lives made us realize that what is dear to us, what gives us great pleasure in our lives, um, we do have a tendency to only realize these things when they go missing. We do tend to take these things for granted. And we also, do not realize how much the Lord provides for us every day through small things in our lives, through the ability to meet up with family and friends, ability to go to school, the ability to meet up in church and meet each other. We have prayed so numerous times that things will start going back to normal. So let us not forget to thank the Lord as things start going back to normal for the small wins that we get throughout our lives. So for our first song, I chose a thankful song, one which is full of praise for the one that loves us, that takes care of us in good times and in bad. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Dreams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, when I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. 
heard it on the news i know that we've not really had that many movies and cinemas but we started to hear about oscars and oscar nominations and oscars are a recognition for best movie best nomination for artists but also nominations for directors so when i was younger i didn't quite understand what the role of the director was behind the scene and the relevance i used to think to myself why are they making so much fuss about this director? I don't even remember seeing him in the movie. But then as I grew older, I kind of recognized the importance of the director in the production. For the last few nights, we've been watching at home um, with Maria and the kids, we've been watching this Maltese music competition production that they put up on a Maltese TV. It's a massive TV production where they bring different singers and they sing songs in Maltese and eventually a winner is identified. It was a great event to watch and a great spectacle, lots of visuals and entertainment. We also happened to know the director of this production. So this gave us a bit of an insight on the massive amount of work that takes place behind the scene. What happens behind the curtains? The director is there in the background, at times forgotten, yet without them knowing, they really bring everything to life on the day. I thought, when I was hearing about this, I thought of a discussion I had with Maria recently about a study that she's been listening to on podcast, a study that talked about the greatest production that has ever taken place on earth, an event that had a massive impact to human lives and human history, a production that was planned for years. We even find evidence of spoilers appearing years before the actual event itself, an event where God was the author and the director. This was the event in history which we can read about in the gospel, where the Son of God came to earth became human like us. And for what? So that he could die and save us from our sins. The story of this event is already fascinating, but yet when you venture into the details and the intricacies around the life, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
how every detail we read about happened for a reason, including the fulfillment of prophecy, fulfillment of promises made years before, you can clearly see the hand of God the director in every little detail. And that makes this even more amazing. Although what is even more fascinating is that these events took place and were prepared specifically for you and me. God had planned and directed this specifically for you and me so that we can see his work, recognize him as our Lord and Savior, and accept his salvation. Isn't that amazing? But the production does not stop there. For those who believe, there are further sequels taking place. With you as the main protagonist, with God as the director in the background. It's fascinating to learn that God was not mentioned once in the book of Esther, but he moved behind the scenes creating a masterpiece. God does that in our lives today as he works behind the scenes creating a masterpiece. This all becomes possible when we believe. Let's praise our Lord together and sing the next song, Praise His Name. Cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all
can I see all the children waving? Are you here on the call? Good. So I've got some people waving. That's good. Um, so I don't know if you have access to your reaction button. Uh, it should be down at the bottom. But can you, um, so you can choose what reaction to choose from and tell me how your week was this week. Okay, thumbs up from David. Uh, thumbs up from Ruby, Natasha. Yeah. Jazz, good. Everyone's got a thumbs up except Avro or Jeff. <laughs> so thumbs up if you made a decision this week. Okay, David has, Ruby has. Yeah, everyone, most people. So can anyone maybe shout out what decision you had to make this week? What I had to have for breakfast. Okay, good. Ruby? What computer I wanted. Okay. Is that to do your homework? No, just for a new computer. Okay. Well, I've got my sister's computer now. Oh, okay, good. Anybody else want to share what decision they've made? No, that's fine. So, but the thing is, everyone uh, makes decisions on a daily basis. Um, that's uh, whether to put your clothes on or stay in your pajamas, uh, whether um, to go to school or stay at home, uh, whether to help your family with your chores or not, um, whether to do your homework or not. And maybe for the older ones, what subjects to decide uh, in your fourth, fifth and sixth year um, and what courses you might pick. So we all face decisions in our life and everyone needs to decide whether to follow Jesus or not. And so that's one of the most important decisions you'll make uh, throughout your entire life, whether to decide whether to make Jesus your Lord and Saviour or reject him and say, no, that's for me. And so I've got three truths I want to sh uh, share to you today. So the first truth is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. So I'm just going to put it up here. Uh, does anybody want to read the first verse? Anyone? Children? Yeah, Ruby, when you go. Then Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let me deny himself, de de deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Yeah, thank you. So what does Jesus tell us, Ruby, um, that we need to do? Mm. Can anyone else help him? Follow him. Yeah, uh, follow him. Mm. What's the second one? Um, deny himself. Yep. So let him deny himself, follow him, and take up his cross. But mm. that's very good knowing that. But what do these actually mean? What does it mean to deny themselves? Does anybody know? Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky one. So de denying themselves is mean renouncing oneself as the center of existence. And I found Edgar's thought really thoughtful because he says that God should be the director of our life, but sometimes we want ourselves to be the director of our own life. And so we might be choosing um, things to do on our own accord and purposes, but Jesus saying that Jesus should be the center of our own life and God should be the director of our own life. And what does it mean to take up the cross? What does that mean? Yeah, so that's one's a bit tricky as well. So take up the cross. So if you remember Jesus on his way to the cross on the mountain, it was very painful. It was he suffered a lot. And so that's what it means to take up your cross. When we remember Jesus, he had a very long and slow journey to that mountain and his death was very slow uh, as well. And he might have suffered loneliness up on the cross and he uh, might have heard people mocking him on the cross and people abandoned him. So we hear of his disciples abandoning him. And so that's what it means for us um, to take up your cross. It means that uh, you might experience pain, you might experience um, suffering in your own life as a Christian. Um, your life might be slow. Your journey as a Christian might be slow and long. Uh, you might experience loneliness. And you might um, have people mocking your faith um, and people might abandon you and say, oh, yeah, let's get rid of her. And your friends might abandon you. 
But that's what Jesus says. And the third thing he says is to follow Jesus. And so if you're not a Christian today, you might think, oh, well, I don't want to be a Christian because I don't want people mocking me or abandoning me. But that comes on to my second truth. And that's good news. So we've had a bit of um, maybe some uh, negative things saying, uh, but the second truth is 2 Timothy 1.7. Does anybody want to read that one? Yeah, David, when you go. For God gave us a spirit, not to fear, but of power and love and self-control. Yeah, and so that's the good news we have, because if we become a Christian, once we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we have the Holy Spirit who comes in us, and the Holy Spirit doesn't give us um, um, a spirit of timidity or of fear, but it says, another version is of boldness, so with uh, the Holy Spirit, we can be bold and have power. Uh, we can love each other, uh, even though that might be hard sometimes. And we have self-control, maybe to say no to the things people tell us to do or just stand up to the truth. And the third truth, uh, does anybody want to read the, the last one? Um, what you... Yeah, yeah, on you go. I have not commanded you. Be, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you, you go. Yeah, thank you. And that's another good news um, that, um, in fact, the Lord himself commanded to Joshua. That's where it's from. But it's the same with us. Wherever we go, whether that's at school or at home in Dumbarton or in Falkirk or Edinburgh or France or Malta or everywhere else, like the Lord is with you wherever you go. And so that's a real encouragement um, for us all to, to think about. And I wonder what truth will you remember today? Is it the truth that God will be with you wherever you go? Is it the truth that uh, if you've become a Christian, you've got the uh, Holy Spirit in you? Or is it the truth that you actually need to deny yourself? You need to come to the point where um, God uh, needs to be the director of your life. Um, so I wonder if you can think about this this morning and uh, throughout this week, what truth uh, will you hold? And you can copy and paste these verses and maybe it, um, put it up in your walls so that you always remember that God is always with you. And what do you need to do to take up your cross and follow Jesus on a daily basis? Not only on a Sunday morning, but every day. What decisions you need to take to do that? So I'll leave that, uh, that, those thoughts uh, to you. And the song I've chosen for the kids is a song that I really enjoyed when I was younger. Uh, it says, be bold, be strong. And it says, for the Lord your God is with you. And it says, I am not ashamed because I am walking in faith and victory. And the Christian walk is all about faith. We need to have faith to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and faith to continue our journey of faith. So yeah, thank you for listening. Be 
strong for the Lord your God is with you. Be bold, be strong for the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid, I am not dismayed, cause I'm walking in faith and victory. Come on and walk in faith and victory for the Pray to the Lord um, to bless the rest of the service and then we'll pass on to Derek for the message this morning. Father God, we thank you, Lord. Such a powerful message from Rona for the kids this morning, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to guide them to take those messages in their heart, Lord, and to accept you as your Lord and Savior, we ask you, Lord, to bless them during this morning as they go to their respective uh, lessons. And we also ask you, Lord, to bless, um, bless Derek as he brings your word to us from Ephesians. We pray this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, good morning to you all. It's good to, uh, good to be with you in, uh, in my next I'm really going to major in on the title of the, of the, of the talk this morning, which is Walk in Love. Um, not that I'm going to ignore all the other important verses that are in chapter 5 of Ephesians, but I want really to primarily talk about the, um, the title, which is Walking in Love. That's what I would like to do um, this morning. And... Um, I want us to think about Christ's walk in love and what it involved for the Lord Jesus. And his walk in love really was a walk to the cross. And I want us to keep that kind of in our minds this morning when we are talking about walking. His walk, the Lord Jesus Christ's walk to the cross, which was a major evidence of God's love for us, remembering that text. John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so the evidence that God gives for his love for us and his love for the world is the walk that the Lord Jesus Christ took to the cross at Calvary. And I'm going to say and suggest to us that the walk that we're on as Christians and followers of the Lord Jesus, to some extent, is as public and as much of a witness to God's love and our love for God as the walk that the Lord Jesus Christ took. So I want to read this morning with you just a very brief passage from Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read just a couple of verses from chapter 4 just to, uh, to introduce the, the opening verses of chapter 5 of Ephesians. And verse 31 of chapter 4 says this, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then verse chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, these are the, the kind of two major readings that I want us to think about mostly this morning. But before we go on to, to look at the implications of walking in love, I really want to read, and I'm going to suggest to you, it's the second letter to the Ephesians. And some of you might be saying there is only one letter to, to Ephesians, but in actual fact, in our Bible, there is two. There's the one that was written by Paul, and there's also one in Revelation chapter 2, which um, was dictated by the Lord Jesus, to John, and John wrote it down, and we have it in chapter 2 of the Revelation. And again, I'm going to take just time to read some of the verses from that letter to the Ephesian church. 
and it says this, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now, to any young folks that's writing, generally that's believed to be the, the, the oversight or the, the elders or the deacon or the pastor of the particular church. It's not literally an angel, at least I don't believe it's an angel uh, in the sense that we might, we might understand it. And he says this, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, have patience, and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, Lord Jesus says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now that was a criticism of the Lord Jesus on this particular church called Ephesus, that they had left their first love. And many of the commentators suggest that it not only was maybe their first love for the Lord Jesus, but possibly, and maybe mainly, it was their first love for one another. That they didn't love one another as they used to love one another. Maybe there had become a kind of a carelessness in their lives in regard to their, their fellowship with one another. And so the Lord Jesus in, in Revelation chapter 2 is giving a distinct warning and he's saying that you've lost the love that you once had and this is the only church in Revelation that has this warning and the warning is and I'm going to put it into my own words and the warning is I'm going to close you down you're no longer of any use to me you're no longer a viable witness to me if you don't any longer love one another. And I think that possibly um, is a dire warning to the Christian community today. And I want to think about that this morning with you. And I've got a number of readings that I want to, to read with you. And the first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And here's the question. What does love look like? What does it look like? And we get that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I think it's valuable that we just take time this morning just to briefly look at the words in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and get a picture of what love actually looks like. Now, not what love sounds like, but what love looks like. And here's what we get in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. Now, this is what it looks like. Love suffers long and is kind. Yeah, that's important that we get this. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Love never fails. Now that's for me is a, is a picture of love. It's a challenging picture. Is that what Derry Watt looks like when people watch her? Is that what Derek Watt likes, looks like when you look at him? Is he bearing out these characteristics of love? 
is he walking in love and is visible by my attitude and my responses, not just to my secular friends, but especially, the Bible says, to my brothers and sisters in the church. Is our love for one another visible? Now, I want you to, read, to look again at, a, at another Bible verse, and this time it's in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and it is in chapter 4, and it's in verse number 9. And again, I'm just really going to kind of quickly rattle through some of these verses, because I think if you note them down and you read them for yourself, then you'll have little sermons that you can speak to yourself about. And here's what verse 9 says. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Now, there's an amazing statement that sometimes we forget. Love doesn't kind of grow out of us naturally, at least not the love that's being spoken about here in our letter to the Ephesians. Isn't natural. It says here that in Thessalonians, we've been taught by God to love one another. It's a necessary requirement of church fellowship. It's necessary. It's required. It's a must have. We must learn to love one another. We've been taught by God to love one another. Now, I think these are amazing words that we're listening to this morning. I think they're powerful. They're challenging to me. It's not that I have an option to love you or that you have an option to love me or that we can discriminate as to who we will love and who we won't love. We've been taught by God from his word, by the Holy Spirit, that we have to love one another. I want us now to look at John chapter 13 very quickly as we go through this journey, this walking experience that we are having um, this morning. We're now in John chapter 13 and we're going to look at verse number 35. John chapter 13 and verse 35. And this again is an important verse. It says this, by this will all know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now that's an amazing verse. That's possibly a verse that's gone, that I've known since I was a little boy. But it's possibly only as I've got older and maybe wiser, if that's something that I've achieved, is the importance of love as a public witness to the gospel. We might think that our public witnessing to the gospel is verbal. It's all about being a good preacher, being a good communicator. But what we're learning here in this particular verse is this. What the world needs to see from the church community is love that is visible. And the visible love that's being emphasized in John chapter 13 and uh, verse 35 is that we love one another. Now, but the only club I've ever been um, involved in or signed up to was the uh, Port Glasgow Golf Club. And um, one of the, at least none of the requirements for me to be a member of the golf club was that I should love my fellow golfers. Never mentioned. And I guess there's not a club or an institution in the land that one of the requirements for, a mem for membership is that you love all your members. But there is one, and I'm going to call it, if you like, an institution. There is one company of people where the first rule is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And in John chapter 
13 here, we have, if you like, another commandment of the Lord Jesus. Love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now there's a challenge for us this morning. Is our love public? Do people look at Lenox Evangelical Church community or our Gowan Square Evangelical Church community and say of us, boy, that's amazing. How on earth can you get a company of people that love each other to the extent that these folks do? I find that challenging. Is that what they see from me, from you? And they say, these must be followers of Jesus, not because of what they say, but because of what they do. They love one another. They are devoted to one another. They help one another in amazing ways. And also they sacrifice for one another. Now that really is quite an amazing, quite an amazing witness that we ought to have in the world. And remember, when we read in the second letter to the Ephesians in Revelation chapter two, because they, their love for one another had waned, was no longer visible, was no longer loud and evident. The Lord Jesus said, I think I'll just pack in with you a lot because really you're not, you're not bearing witness to me as you ought. Now there's a challenge for us today about walking with God or walking in love. I want us to turn now to John chapter 14 and just see what the Bible has to say in John chapter 14 and verse number 15. And this is what it says there. And again, the Lord Jesus is the speaker, is the spokesperson. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now this might kind of surprise you. Most of you know me and you maybe know my background, which is brethren. Now, I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm just going to let you know that's where my roots are. That's where I've come from. And, to, and really, that's where I am now. But I heard this expression in a brethren meeting. Now, you listen to this. I was told that it's no longer necessary to keep the commandments. They're no longer for the Christian community. No longer for that. We are no longer under law. We are under grace. Now, those of you who know your Bible know that the book of Romans was basically written or mainly written to tackle that problem, that, that um, false teaching that now that we're Christians, we don't come under law. The commandments are no longer mandatory for us. But Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And of course, maybe the commandment that's being emphasized in this particular chapter is the commandment to love one another. Wow, a commandment to love one another. Now, why might that be necessary? Well, I know why it's necessary for me to be commanded to love my brothers and sisters, because I can so easily get fed up with them. I can so easily get annoyed with them. And again, now referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I can so quickly lose patience with them. I can so readily remember faults and sins and hurts and offenses. I keep a record of wrongs. All of that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's so easy to become critical. It's so easy to become superior. And the commandment of our Lord Jesus is this. Here's the antidote to all of these things. Love. Love. Love one another. That's so important for us to remember. Now, I'm getting very near to the end of um, a little talk this morning. 
But there is another verse that I want to, to read with you, and it's in Galatians chapter 5. And I'm pretty certain already many of you are way ahead of me, and you already are now thinking about this verse in Galatians chapter 5. And I'm, the question is, where does this love, this holy, this Christian love stem from? Well, it's from the Holy Spirit himself. It's not natural to us to, to have the kind of love that's expected of us in the, in the, as we walk the, the walk of love as Christians. It isn't the kind of a natural resource that we have. It actually comes from the Spirit of God. And what we read here in Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, among other things, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Folks, maybe the reason we fail in loving one another as we ought is because we don't live within the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not bearing the fruit that we ought to bear, which comes from the Holy Spirit, that we should love one another. It comes from God. It's God's love and it's God's way for us. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the visible deeds of the Holy Spirit, which is in us, one of these constituencies, one of these fruits is the fruit of love. Now, there's a challenge to us. If we are living natural, secular lives and loving simply as the world loves, we won't manifest this, this witness that we ought to, that all men should see that we love one another because of our love for the Lord, for the Lord Jesus. Now, our second last reading is in First Peter, and it's in chapter number four, and it's verse eight. 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. This is what it says there. And above all things, above all things, so you may have got your priority list there in front of you, but according to Peter, above all things, have love for one another. Now, I wonder if that's the priority, number one priority in my life. And I wonder if it is in your life. It's my priority to love my brothers and sisters above everything and anything else. Now, there's a challenge for me and for you. Is that seen in my walk that I absolutely love my brothers and sisters? That's challenging. And why is it necessary to love my brothers and sisters? Well, I think the next line of this verse tells us why. Because it says this, perfect love. Sorry, I'm misquoting it. I'm thinking of another, another verse um, that we have. And it says this, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, there's, there's a good reason and a necessary reason for loving one another. Now, you folks and all of us folks who are married, and I ask myself this question, why on earth does Marian love me? Why does she put up with me? Well, I know why she puts up with me, and it's simply, she loves me. And she, and perfect love, her love covers a whole lot of my inadequacies and my contrariness. And well, you'll maybe have another list that you can put to my list there about me. That's why we should love one another. In our assemblies, we're far too critical. We really don't show this kind of love to one another. And that's why we are commanded to love one another. If we don't love one another, all that you will ever see in Derek Watt, for example, is faults, inadequacies. 
You will only ever have grievances. But if you love me, you'll love Christ. You'll love me as a believer, as a, a brother in Christ. And that love you have for me and I for you will cover a multitude of sins. Now, our last reading this morning is from 1 John chapter 4, and it's verses 22 and 23. And I'm beginning to wonder if I maybe written down the verses right. If someone says, sorry, it's not, it's 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother. Now, that's an amazing journey um, we have been on this morning. This walk, this journey, this walking in love. It's not easy. It's not natural, it doesn't just happen, it becomes deliberate, it becomes necessary for us to be in love with Jesus, to understand all his love shed abroad in our hearts, and to allow the compassion of Jesus to shine through us to one another. You know, sometimes we think that to be a good Christian our love has got to be directed towards the unbelievers. Well, it's God that does the loving, if you can understand what I'm saying, to the non-believers. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's perfectly able to show his love to the unbelieving world through Jesus. And yes, we are witnesses of that. But you know, the witness that we give to that primarily is that we love one another. For people coming into our meeting places and seeing that warmth of love that we have for one another, I'm sure must be an amazing evangelical tool. When you see that love, I'm sure they just want to be part of it. They want to enjoy it. They want to be surrounded with it and by it. They want to know the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, that's manifested in a practical way from his children. And that, dear brothers and sisters, is my little talk this morning on walking in love. May God bless you. Amen. Let's say a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the message this morning, Lord. We thank you that you first loved us, Lord, and through that love, you, Lord, you do not see our faults. Lord, help us be a mirror of your love for us towards our brothers and sisters, Lord, but also of those around us. And through that love, Lord, we bring others to you to enjoy the fullness of what we experience through your salvation. We ask you, Lord, to bless us during the rest of today, Lord, and the weeks to come, and Lord, to keep you as our main focus and always exhume love towards other, others, Lord, so that we're spreading your word. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. We close off this morning the comments may the grace of lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen Every weakness and knows every fear and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul.
Oh